Ladies and gentlemen, it is time for the great global citizen, the white male straight from the States, the dork in New York, the head in the shed. It is time to stand up with Pete Dominic. Stand up. Yeah, thank you very much, Dan McDonald. What a wonderful and hilarious introduction that was. I greatly appreciate it, buddy. Danny Mac, hope to see you tonight, Dan. And everybody else at the Hangout, it's 8 o'clock tonight, and if you're not already a subscriber, you're going to want to join up right now because you'll have access to my guest from yesterday's episode, the woman, uh, a candidate for mayor in Buffalo, New York, India Walton, is going to join us tonight at the Hangout if you're listening on Thursday, the 13th of May. That is when I'm talking about, and that is when we will welcome India Walton tonight, and that should be great. I'm very much excited to have her join us, and always excited to see you as well. So go now, if you haven't already, signed up at patreon.com slash Dominic or the paid subscription link in the show notes. Today's show, awesome! I've got both Ali Velshi and Jared Yates Sexton joining me wonderful thought-provoking conversations with both of them coming up but right now it's time to get to yesterday's news it's time for the last 24 wtf happened yesterday or today is the name of the actual email that i subscribe to uh wtf just happened today day 113 Matt Kaiser writes, House Republicans removed Representative Liz Cheney from her leadership role because of her criticism of Trump's repeated lie that the 2020 election was stolen from him and his role in January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol. Trump's acting attorney general testified that the Justice Department had, quote, no evidence of widespread voter fraud at the time of the January 6th attack. More than 100 Republicans threatened to form a third party if the Republican Party doesn't break with Trump. President Biden's attorney general and Homeland Security secretary both testify that the greatest domestic threat to the U.S. is from, quote, those who advocate for the superior superiority of the white race. And House Democrats and the White House reached an agreement to allow Don McGahn to testify before Congress about Trump's efforts to obstruct Robert Mueller's investigation. That is from Matt Kaiser at WTF happened today. And uh, always a great email to subscribe to. But let's start there with House Republicans removing Congresswoman Liz Cheney from her leadership role because of her criticism of Trump's repeated lie that the 2020 election was stolen from him. And then, of course, his role in the insurrection on the U.S. Capitol. Here is Liz Cheney in her own words yesterday. How concerned are you that former President Trump might end up back in the Oval Office? And what are you prepared to do to prevent uh, I... Uh will do uh, everything I can to ensure uh, that uh, the former president never again gets anywhere near the Oval Office. We have seen the danger uh, that he continues to provoke with his language. Uh, We have seen his lack of commitment and dedication to the Constitution. Uh, And I think it's very important that we make sure whomever we elect is somebody who will be faithful to the Constitution. Do you feel betrayed by today's vote? I do not. I think that uh, it is uh, an indication of where the Republican Party is, uh, and I think that the party uh, is in a place that we've got to bring it back from, and we've got to get back to a position where uh, we are a party that can fight for conservative principles, that can fight for substance. We cannot be dragged backward uh, by uh, the very dangerous lies of a former president. Thank Thank you. Well, it would seem Liz Cheney wanted this fight, and now she has got it. And Kevin McCarthy, who is an absolutely disgraceful human being, is going to go down in history as one of the most cowardly villains American politics had ever seen. This is what he had to say, and this was really outrageous and triggering for everybody who has just been paying attention and watching the news. Here's Kevin McCarthy outside the White House after he met with congressional leadership and the president. And we could talk about that later. Well, first of all, the conference will decide, but I don't think anybody is questioning the legitimacy of the presidential election. I think that is all over with. We're sitting here with the president today. 
Um, so from that point of view, I don't think that's a problem. Wait, what? I, why is he? Why did he say that? He clearly knows exactly what's happening uh, with the entire right wing media echo chamber, as well as the former president uh, and what he is putting out every day. And of course, the recount or whatever you want to call it, the fraud, it is what I've been calling it. Somebody got upset that they heard that somewhere else, thought that that uh, they stole it from me. I know I stole it from somebody else. I don't know. I don't know where that came from, but fraud it. He's uh, that's happening in Arizona right now. So I don't know why Kevin McCarthy said that. And I'm not sure why he was. It seemed like he was allowed to get away with that in the moment uh, at that, uh, you know, press availability. But we'll see what happens next with Kevin McCarthy. They having I mean, that's bizarre, right? All right, so here is Senator Dick Durbin. He is the, I think, second most powerful Senate uh, senator in the Democratic uh, caucus in the in the Democratic Senate, and he is, of course, of Illinois. And Dick Durbin had this to say on the Senate floor yesterday about Republicans removing Liz Cheney from leadership and how they did it as well. They did it in a closed room. No one in the public was allowed to watch. They did it by a voice vote so that there would be no physical record of individual congressmen and how they vote. And they decided to remove a member of the Republican leadership in the House of Representatives this morning in that fashion. These proud, courageous disciples of Donald Trump didn't want to be on the record publicly as to where they stood on the fate of Congresswoman Cheney. This is the same Congresswoman Cheney who was re-elected to leadership in the House just a few weeks ago. This is the same Congresswoman Cheney who is one of the most ideologically conservative members of the House. She voted with President Trump nearly 93% of the time while she was in office. And with a name like Cheney, it's hard to question her Republican credentials. No, the decision in private, in secret, this morning by a voice vote was about it not a disagreement over policy but the issue as to whether or not Liz Cheney dares to tell the truth she refused to defend or ignore the big lie that the 2020 election was stolen from Donald Trump and in today's Republican parties it seems like that is all that's necessary for grounds for removal. Okay, so that's Senator Dick Durbin. Now let's go to Senator Bernie Sanders and his thoughts on the subject. I bet you he starts with, oh, look. Look. Uh, Nailed it. What I hope people understand, and I, and I don't mean to be overly partisan in saying this, is what happened today in the House with the removal of Representative Liz Cheney from leadership is a very profound statement. And Cheney's crime, the reason she was removed, is she has said correctly that Donald Trump is lying, that he lost the election, and what Trump is trying to do is undermine American democracy. That's what she said, and for saying that, she was removed for leadership. All over this country, you're seeing Republican governors and legislatures trying to make it harder in outrageous ways for people of color, for low-income people, for young people to vote and participate in the political process. They're coming up with these incredible gerrymandered districts to protect Republicans. The challenge of this moment, of all the problems we face, is whether or not we remain a democratic society. Yeah, well said, even though the audio there was a bit modulated. That was then not me, for once. Not my audio feed, of course. And also heard from Republican Congressman Adam Kinzinger, who has been a strong, a staunch ally of Liz Cheney's and the truth, at least about the election, And I thought this was pretty interesting because he detailed, obviously, his thoughts on it and what happened behind closed doors. Uh, Liz has committed the only sin of being consistent and telling the truth. The truth is that the election was not stolen. 74 million voters were not disenfranchised. They were just outnumbered. And it's important for our party to take inventory of that and go out and win the next election instead of continuing the big lie. So... Look, I stand with Liz. I'm proud of her. There's a lot of people that are proud of her for what she's done and a lot of people that feel threatened by her. And that's their decision. But 
going forward, I think she's going to be a great leader for this country and this party. Congressman, how many supporters did she have in the room? I think there were a lot, but we ended up going by voice vote. And uh, the ironic thing was it was to show unity. So at that point, it's not even worth the fight. You walk out and you say, all right, the you know, leader's made his decision. That's fine. And he'll he'll have to hold to whatever that is. There was no speeches, really. It was just uh, Kevin standing up and... And then the, the vote was taken. So it was definitely not what I expected, but uh, basically it's time to move on from her. He said, uh, you know, we have to be unified and continue with this whole unity theme. And uh, look, I'm all for unity. Uh, I'm all for unity and truth. You know, uh, truth cannot coexist with lies. Truth cannot coexist with falsehood. You cannot unify with that. And I think that's what Liz has been saying. So thank you, everybody. I'll tell you, it's, uh, it was a sad day. What do you think of Liz? Uh, look, I, uh, in terms of anybody going forward, I'll, I'll take that decision. I think anybody that was sniffing around for this job before Liz was out, obviously that's not a great thing. Uh, I think for me, I'll vote for somebody that's going to tell the truth to the voters. Because as leaders, your job isn't just to make it comfortable for the rank and file members. Your job is to tell people the truth. And by the way, to our base voters who believe the election was stolen, honestly, I don't blame them because their leaders have told them the exact same thing. That's why it's important for people to tell the truth. Thanks, guys. Take care. All right. That's Congressman Adam Kinzinger telling his truth yesterday on Capitol Hill for reporters sake. Uh, I liked how Chris Hayes started his show last night. All in on MSNBC. Always love watching that show. And uh, here is just uh, how he began the first minute or so. In the end, it was done in the basement. Congresswoman Liz Cheney, Wyoming, purged from Republican leadership this morning, just after 9 a.m., for the unforgivable sin of refusing to lie about the last Republican president's attempts to destroy America's tradition of peaceful transfer of power. It was done in the basement in the most cowardly way imaginable with a voice vote. They did a voice vote because they were afraid of their votes being on the record. And they did not do a secret ballot because they were afraid they might not win the vote. So now there is no written record of how the Republican members of the House voted. It was not in public, but as I mentioned, in the auditorium of the Capitol basement, and it was done in 20 minutes or so. New York Times reporting that some members missed the vote because they were arriving to the meeting when it broke up. It all happened so quickly. Now, Congresswoman Liz Cheney uh, has placed herself now outside the Trump movement that has enveloped the Republican Party. Although, remember, the main way she has set herself outside of the movement is just by continuing to say the simple truth that much of the party agreed upon in the hours after the violent mob stormed the Capitol, chanting hang Mike Pence and trying to install the loser of the election over the winner against the will of the American people. All right. One final clip specifically relevant to this is from Fox News, where Brett Baer asked Mitch McConnell uh, about, about this and not exactly a profile of courage here. He pressed him like three times, but here just a, a little sampling of what we heard. Congresswoman Cheney said on the floor last night, we face a threat America has never seen before, a former president who provoked a violent attack on the Capitol. Uh, she went on to say in an effort to steal the election, he's resumed his aggressive effort to convince Americans that the election was stolen from him. He risks inciting further violence. Is there anything that she said that you disagree with there? I don't know how many times I have to tell you. Uh, I'm focusing on dealing with the conditions we find ourselves in now. With regard to the election, I voted to certify the election. Uh, I expressed myself on that issue on several different occasions several months ago, but now we're in May. And the issue is, what can we agree on to do for the American people on a bipartisan basis? Now, and I hear... <laughs> All right. That is Mitch McConnell avoiding the most important and obvious question. He had said his piece critical of Donald Trump uh, back in January. And you're not going to hear any more criticism from him uh, about Donald Trump because he knows that's bad for him, apparently, because his people are crazy. Well, yesterday, speaking of crazy, yesterday there was a House oversight hearing uh, titled the Capitol Insurrection, Unexplained Delays and Unanswered Questions. And there was a lot of craziness that happened during that hearing. This is probably the craziest thing that was said. This is a, a congressman. His name is Andrew Clyde. He's a Republican from Georgia. And he said this. Let me be clear. There was no insurrection. And to call it an insurrection, in my opinion, is a bold faced lie. Watching the TV footage of those who entered the Capitol and walked through Statuary Hall, 
showed people in an orderly fashion staying between the stanchions and ropes, taking videos and pictures. You know, if you didn't know the TV footage was a video from January the 6th, you would actually think it was a normal tourist visit. Some clever video editor uh, put up video of the uh, violence at, at on January 6th next to this dumb shit Andrew Clyde saying what you just heard him say. It was pretty, pretty clever. We also heard from the acting secretary of defense who was right there at the end and there in January uh, for Donald Trump and Democrats really beat the shit out of this guy. Uh, here is a, a very angry Congressman Ro Connick grilling the former acting secretary of defense, Christopher Miller. Thank you, Madam Chair. Secretary Miller, I have never been more offended on this committee by a witness statement than yours. You were more concerned about defending your own reputation and justifying your own actions than the sanctity of this capital and the sanctity of our democracy. Have you no sense of accountability? No sense of shame? Secretary Miller, I want to ask you today, will you at the very least apologize to the American public for what happened on your watch? I want to highlight the incredible job that the members of our armed forces and the civilians. Miller, and the I, I agree with you about the armed that forces. The, Every, the, Secretary Miller, it's purpose. my time. Your pugnacious style is not going to override the democratic process. Learn to respect it. My question isn't about our troops or our armed forces. Everyone recognizes they're extraordinary. My question is about your incompetence in leading them. Will you apologize to the American public for what happened on your watch? Will you apologize to the troops for what happened on your watch? The Department of Defense and our members of the armed forces performed magnificently yes, on January no one, 6th Secretary, and no one is questioning the what they did by questioning what you did. Is it your testimony that you refuse to apologize to the American public for what happened? I stand by every decision I made on January so you 6th. you think you did everything perfectly? Just like the president said, he did everything perfectly in his calls. Is that your testimony? You did everything perfectly, no mistakes? I want to highlight again that the armed forces should only be used for domestic it's law not, enforcement. I don't, I, is it your other... testimony that you did everything perfectly? Is that your view? I am the most critical person I'm a career Let special officer. Uh, Ew, gross. What a dick. Oh, horrible. And you should hear or see the rest if you haven't already. I mean, it was disgraceful. They were calling the insurrectionists. Republicans were patriots and saying, as you heard, there was no insurrection and they did the right thing and just just disgusting. Also, the one of the Capitol police officers whose name you may have heard of, the guy who suffered a heart attack after he had the shit kicked out of him with his own equipment, by the way, Officer Fanon, he tried has been trying to set up a meeting with Kevin McCarthy and McCarthy refused to meet with him. And yesterday McCarthy staff hung up on the guy. So, so much for supporting the police, obviously, unless they can use them uh, to divide us. All right. A few more things I want to play for you, including the governor of Ohio, who yesterday announced a million dollar lottery for adults who have gotten vaccinated. I got it wrong. and thought it was anybody who hasn't gotten vaccinated but anybody who's gotten vaccinated, and this is a way to get more people vaccinated, their name will be entered into a lottery. And this is a pretty fascinating uh, proposal. It's being criticized on all sides and uh, complimented by a bunch of people as well. Some people think this is a really good idea. Here's the governor of Ohio, Mike DeWine, introducing it yesterday. On May 26th, we will announce a winner of a separate drawing for adults adults who have received at least their first dose of the vaccine. This announcement will occur each Wednesday for five weeks, and the winner each Wednesday will receive $1 million. How about that? Good idea? Bad idea? Well, disgraced Congressman Jim Jordan uh, of Ohio says that we've gone from 15 days to slow the spread to 1 million if you get the COVID-19 vaccine. Give me a break. That's a Republican and douchebag of Ohio, Jim Jordan, Jim with a G. And then you've got people like Tim Murphy, who is a liberal writer at Mother Jones, saying, I'm sorry, I think this rules. And congrats to Mike DeWine for coming up with this before Andrew Yang. 
So just a couple of uh, comments on that interesting proposal. What do you think? I'll ask you tonight at the Hangout if you join me at 8 Eastern for stand-up subscribers. That'll be one of the things I'm interested to hear from our Ohio friend. Finally tonight, today, whenever you're listening to this, I don't know, I'm taping it at night, so that's why I said that. As I look outside the shed, it's dark. So I want to play for you just a couple of clips of President Biden yesterday because I wanted to make sure that if you were wide awake that you would be become sleepy because is Sleepy Joe, but thought these were important. I wanted to grab them for you. First, from a very hard-hitting interview where the president sat down with MSNBC's Lawrence O'Donnell, uh, he asked him what he thinks his son, Bo Biden, would say about his first 100 days. I mean, not a tough question, but, well thought this is interesting. You're 113 days into the presidency. This is the top of the mountain. You were climbing this career mountain for many, many years. You're the most prepared president in history with 36 years in the Senate, eight years as vice president. The one thing you don't have on this 113th day in the presidency is your son Bo's advice. And I'm just wondering uh, what you would say if Bo called you today and said, hey, Pop, how's it going? I say, Bo, I remember what you say to me every single time they talk about a political issue. He said, Dad, look at me. I give him my word. He said, Dad, look at me. Remember, home base. Home base. Be who you are. The one thing that I'd hope that he would say is, Dad, Your home base, you're sticking to it. Some things are worth losing over, old buddy. I haven't done this this long to die now to do things that I don't don't believe. Mr. President, thank you very much for your time today. We really appreciate it. You always catch me off guard with Bo. God love him. He should be sitting in this chair. Ooh, that was a tearjerker right there from the president talking about his son who passed away of cancer. Two years back, of course. Uh, He also made a video to let folks know that kids 12 and up can now get the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine. Go to vaccines.gov to find a vaccine near you. Here he is. To all the parents out there, there's some good news. Your children ages 12 to 15 can get vaccinated now. Go to vaccines.gov. Find the nearest place you can get a vaccination. It's easy. It's free. It's convenient. And we're all counting on you. We need you all to get vaccinated, please. A few other COVID-related headlines. Uh, many of the states in the United States with the worst recent outbreaks have shown notable drops in new cases and hospitalizations. So that's good. Experts are calling for sweeping reforms to prevent the next pandemic. That's also good. Millions of Americans, however, remain unvaccinated because of practical obstacles, not just hesitancy. So that's bad, but will be good. Uh, A lot of U.S. parents are hesitant about the COVID shot for their kids, even if they're not anti-vaccine. My wife has been having some hesitancy, so that's not great, but it's understandable that parents could be concerned. And uh, yesterday, the uh, the WeWork CEO made some controversial uh, comments when he said the least engaged employees are the ones who work from home, making a whole bunch of people who work from home absolutely outraged at that person. Just a few COVID-related headlines. And finally, just got to get to what is happening in the Middle East, which is so hard to talk about, not only because it's controversial, because there's so many details around it that, you know, for me to kind of discuss it and cover it is is tough. But the, you know, within a a minute or two, but basically the, the fighting between Israel and Palestinian militants is showing no signs of letting up as rockets and missiles streaked across the sky. Last night, I I watched a couple of videos about how that Iron Dome missile defense system works. It's fascinating, and I think that we paid for it and sent it to the Israelis. Uh, Most shocking developments occurred on the streets as rival mobs attacked cars, shops, and people in several cities, according to New York Times. Well, says dozens of civilians have been killed, and Israel claimed the assassinations of senior militants. A lot more to discuss on that front. But I last night, I, I mentioned this on yesterday's podcast. I actually went back after I got done taping, uh, putting the show together, and I'm, I'm in bed, and I put on YouTube the, the debate between Noam Chomsky and 
Alan Dershowitz at Harvard from about 10 years ago, I think it was, I forget. And uh, I just listened to it. I shouldn't have. I should have been sleeping. But I listened to the whole thing. I highly recommend that. I also found this clip because my friend Sam Cedar uh, reshared this from Michael Brooks, who unfortunately passed away suddenly last year. Michael Brooks said this, and I, I, I have a hard time disagreeing with Michael Brooks on much. I always did. I think he's a brilliant guy. But w- what do you make of this? So, is- so it's not a complex issue. That's the big thing. It's super simple. There's one group that has enormous power. It's the most powerful country in the Middle East. It's backed by the United States. It acts on another population of people with total impunity and is never held accountable for anything. So there's no symmetry in the relationship, period. And just as like a thought experiment, IDW people, if we know that if somehow a population of Jewish refugees ended up in West Bank in Gaza and an Arabic government in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv had an open air prison in, in what, you know, Jewish Gaza, which they bombed with white phosphorus, they killed civilians indiscriminately and they had no uh, provisions for medicine They had an embargo that blocked food, that the electricity wasn't running, that there was an over 48% unemployment rate, life expectancy and malnutrition statistics were horrifying. uh, One of the major uh, policy makers in this hypothetical Arabic Palestinian state said, we need to put those Jews on a diet. In the West Bank, there was another Jewish area where there was a little bit more autonomy, but there was regular Arabic settlements where they pulled up the Jewish farmers' foods, they terrorized them with rocks, the security forces broke children's bones, and they couldn't drive on their own roads. We'd all have no problem understanding what that was. So there's nothing complex about it. The second part of your question, it's, it's a pure asymmetry relationship, and the question is rights or not. So that's it. It's not complicated. Well, that is one point of view from the late Michael Brooks. There's obviously a billion points of view on this issue. I'm open to so many of them. Would love to discuss it with folks and we'll hope to get somebody on uh, on the show to talk about it as well. I'm also always uh, enjoying reading Peter Beinart. You know, I, I, I'm I'm pretty interested in obviously reading Jewish Americans and Israelis on this issue and their points of view as well as Arab Americans or Muslims uh, from any country. I I think all those opinions are valid. So many are are more informed than others. And there's so many folks that are are just very narrow minded on the whole thing. I think that there's so much history and there's so much to talk about. But in the end, I have a hard time agreeing with what we just heard from Michael Brooks there. But maybe we'll talk about it tonight at the Hangout. If you join me, Uh, maybe not. Maybe we'll just have fun and make fun of each other. Speaking of fun, let's get to today's news dump, shall we? Here now, stand-up listener Pete Coe with a new news dump jingle. Cuddly kitten on your lap, sitting like a lump. Your lap's now covered in feces for today's news dump. Oh, no. Oh, no. Well, I'm never ready for the animal sound. I always forget that it's coming. Well done, Pico. Thank you very much. Here is everything else from yesterday in today's news dump. Let's start with news from Tesla. Electric car maker Tesla is going to stop accepting Bitcoin as payment. The CEO, Elon Musk, tweeted on Wednesday, citing environmental concerns. He said, we're concerned about rapid increasing use of fossil fuels for Bitcoin mining and transactions, especially coal, which has the worst emissions of any fuel, and added that cryptocurrency is a good idea on many levels, but its promise cannot come at the great cost to the environment. And he said, they won't be selling any of the Bitcoin it owns. He's not going to be selling, Tesla won't be selling any of the Bitcoin it owns. That didn't stop the price of Bitcoin from falling. Cryptocurrency, I don't want to understand it. I don't understand it. If you do and you want me to understand it, by all means, reach out. Speaking of automakers, more automaker news. The chip shortage is continuing and cars are scarce and prices are apparently up. Automakers are cutting production as they grapple with a global shortage of computer chips And that's making uh, uh, car dealers pretty nervous, apparently. Uh, If you want to read more about that, ABC News, the Associated Press, and more reporting on that story. And I like the way that Newser.com wrote up this story. The world's highest paid athlete spent less than eight minutes competing in his sport in the last 12 months, but still took home $180 million. UFC star Conor McGregor, who lost his January fight against Dustin Poirier at 232 into the second round, topped this year's Forbes list. The 32-year-old Irishman, number one for the second time, made $22 million from that fight, but he made a whole lot more from his whiskey business. He sold 
his majority stake in whiskey brand proper number 12 to Proximo Spirits for $100 million, $150 million last month. So that's just a, a crazy story that I wanted to mention. And that guy seems like a complete total asshole from what I can tell. Here's another hilarious headline from Newser.com. Feds warn against hoarding gasoline in plastic bags. The government says there's no need for Americans to be hoarding gasoline, especially not if they're going to be putting it in plastic bags. Do not fill plastic bags with gasoline, the Consumer Product Safety Commission said in a tweet Wednesday. Other tweets urged consumers to only use approved containers for fuel and never pour gasoline near an open flame. Snopes, though, is uh, saying, Snopes.com, that images and videos of gas and plastic bags that are currently widely circulating were actually taken years before this week's panic fine, which has caused many stations in the southeast to run out of fuel. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg urged Americans Wednesday to be sensible and safe, saying hoarding does not make things better. All right. So that's a pretty crazy story that uh, I'm certainly following. A lot of folks talking about inflation. Consumer prices up 4.2% over the past 12 months. We haven't seen inflation like this since 2008. I highly recommend that you read uh, Barry Ritholtz's piece on this at his blog titled, Is it Inflation or Partisan Politics? I'll talk with him about that uh, next week. Superstar comedian, longtime talk show host, Ellen DeGeneres, ending, announced that she'd be ending her long-running daytime talk show, according to Variety.com. The Ellen DeGeneres show will officially end after the upcoming 2021-22 season. DeGeneres hosted the series two, since 2003. The show will have run 19 seasons by the time it ends. Recently, of course, Ellen DeGeneres came under fire due to allegations of racist behavior and intimidation on the show. Variety reporter on the outrage among the show's crew members over pay reduction, lack of communication, poor treatment by producers after the pandemic shut down. Production and non-union tech company was hired to tape the show remotely from her home. Anyway, she eventually did address the allegations, and three top producers of the series were, were fired, but the damage to her reputation was done, particularly as it seemed in contrast to her public image as a really likable person, a comic who never worked blue, and someone who urged her own viewers to be kind. So there you go. Ellen DeGeneres is done with the talk show. And apparently there's a chicken shortage. Really? Uh, I didn't, I didn't realize that. I, I'm wondering, I'm trying to understand this, but Tyson chicken is now blaming underperforming roosters for the shortage. Uh, They are, they say they are not producing as many chicks as expected. And, and they're struggling to ramp up chicken supply because the new roosters has been using for fertilizing eggs and breeding new chicks simply aren't hitting expectations. I mean, I've always thought roosters are assholes, but I never thought that they weren't consummate producers. That surprises me. I'm sure there's a lot more to that disgusting story. And every day I see uh, news stories about studies, different studies that say different things, and I always resist mentioning them, but I'm not going to resist mentioning this one. I'm not even going to read about it, but I, I did read the headline and thought it was kind of funny. Uh, if not uh, terrifying, but apparently uh, a new study says that COVID found in penile tissue may even lead to erectile dysfunction. So everything now is uh, connected to COVID, your sense of smell, your memory, your mood, your fingernails, and apparently your erection too. So get vaccinated and don't worry about it. How about that? All right, that is all I've got for you for the news dump. And coming up, I've got a great conversation with author, podcaster, commentator, historian. Always love talking to Jared Yates Sexton. That's coming up. Uh, But before that, I've got Ali Velshi. But before that, I've got to tell you about this because I am very happy that I'm now working with Indeed.com because they have a great service. It's a great company. What do they do? Well, they help you find great people for your company. If you're the hiring expert for your company and you need help making your shortlist of quality candidates, you need a hiring partner who helps make your life easier, you need Indeed.com. You know, what kind of jobs did you have growing up? What were the best jobs? What were the worst jobs? How did you find good people to work at those jobs? How did they find you? 
I worked at the New York State Fair. I worked at Disney World. I was a personal trainer. I babysat. I did it all. But I never really had a serious big boy job until I got hired at corporate media with Sirius XM. And I don't think they used Indeed.com, because if they did, we would have found even better candidates. You know, Indeed is the not as the job site that makes hiring easy as one, two, three, post, screen, and interview all on Indeed. You get your quality shortlist of candidates whose resumes on Indeed match your job description faster. Only pay for the candidates that meet must-have qualifications and schedule complete video interviews on your Indeed dashboard, which is pretty cool. Indeed also makes connecting with and hiring the right talent fast. And easy, they've got tools like Indeed Instant Match, which give you quality candidates whose resume on Indeed fits your job description immediately. Also, Indeed skills tests that, on average, reduce hiring time by 27%. That's a lot of time you're saving. You can also choose from more than 130 skills tests or add your own. Then, add your must-have requirements so you only pay for applications that meet them. According to Talent Nest, Indeed delivers four times more hires than all other job sites combined. How about that? If you're hiring, you need Indeed. Get started right now with a free $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash stand up. Get a $75 credit at Indeed.com slash stand up now. Indeed.com slash stand up. This offer is valid through June 30th terms and conditions apply. Well, I'm very excited that I have uh, pretty much a monthly conversation with my next guest who I've known for over 10 years when he took me under his wing when I started at CNN. He is just an all-around great guy, born in Kenya, raised in Canada, and has spent most of his career working in the good old U.S. of A. at CNN, where he was chief business correspondent at Al Jazeera. And now he is really hitting his stride and doing, in my opinion, his best work. MSNBC, where he hosts Velshi every Saturday and Sunday, 8 to 10 a.m. Eastern on MSNBC. You should tape it. You should listen to the podcast version of it. And you should follow Ali Velshi on Twitter at Ali Velshi. He's the author of Give Me My Money Back from 2008 and co-author of our friend with our friend CNN's Christine Romans of How to Speak Money from 2010. And I always love talking to him, and today's conversation is no exception. Here now, my latest with the great, the awesome, the powerful, the brilliant, the hilarious, the beautiful, Ali Velshi. Ali Velshi, why was I more upset that Ted Cruz was looking at his phone while Amy Klobuchar, Senator uh, Amy Klobuchar, during a, a hearing was talking to him than almost anything else that he's done? It really it really got me that he would they refused to look at her and looked at his phone. It really, he, he did it on purpose and it worked. Yeah. And and he is a provocateur, right? Like it's, he's just an interesting guy. It, Josh Hawley does it by saying uh, outlandish things and doing outlandish things. Ted Cruz, remember, he's the guy who um, uh, Lindsey Graham said that if you if you shot him on the floor of the Senate and held the trial here, you wouldn't get convicted. I mean, this is not a guy who makes That's friends right. easily, which is interesting to me because. He seems to be so chummy with Donald Trump, who said the nastiest things about him, yeah. his wife, his father. I mean, if somebody talked about my wife that way, it would be clear, other than my own morals not allowing me to you know, continue a relationship to them, my wife just wouldn't let me. So I, I, my, Ted Cruz is, is magical in his ability to get under people's skin. It's interesting to hear you say that, because didn't your father have something to do with RFK's assassination? We don't talk about it anymore. You know, we just sort of leave that aside. That is such a when you say weird stuff like that. How do you overcome that? What does the reconciliation well, process look like? Maybe Ted is somebody we should learn something from, right? In terms of reconciliation, that Ted can make friends with you no matter what you say to him. He can he can become your ally and your biggest uh, supporter. Well, let's be clear. We know, we know what the truth is, right? The truth is this is about getting Trump supporters and. Politicians across the board, from Lindsey Graham to Josh Hawley to Tom Cotton to uh, all of them, they've all decided that what I stand for and my political ability is not the thing that's going to make me the president of the United States. Donald Trump's cult-like supporters are what is going to help me be the president of the United States. So I'm going to do whatever I have to do to appeal to them. They've just decided it's not about my argument. It's not about my debates, not about how smart I am, because when you look at Holly and you look at Cruz and you look at Lindsey Graham, they're all very smart people. They're highly educated, well-trained, experienced people. 
But they're not leaning on their smarts right now. They're leaning on something entirely different. Well, opportunism and politics and really, you know, maintaining power because it does seem to some extent unprecedented. I mean, you could argue that during a primary, things get ugly. I mean, between Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, things got ugly a couple times and then say, you know, that was a primary. But that's not the case during the 2015 primary. I mean, with Rand Paul, with Marco Rubio, with Jeb Bush, but more importantly, as you're talking about with Ted Cruz. Yeah. Um, and and the insults and the things that those guys, Lindsey Graham, said about Trump, the things that they said about him, up and, and now to cozy up to him, that's far different than you yeah. know other political fights during a primary. But let me to move it uh, along. It is to some extent these Republicans that you just named and many others, all these and probably many of them in the House, some of them maybe are true believers in conspiracies, but they're saying I don't, I know this is wrong, I know. I don't believe this, but if I want to stay in power, the vast majority of the people in my district or state do believe it. And so I have to go along with it. That's the way I interpret it. Yeah. What do you, is that right? Yeah, sure. I mean, why is Liz Cheney now out of her job as, as the Republican conference chair? She didn't say anything outlandish. She didn't come out and speak against Trump. She just said the election was honest. Right. That was that's not a weird out there position. More importantly, well, the, she voted to impeach him. Because he's lying about the election and he fomented insurrection. I mean, again, it's it's why are you on? Why is somebody on Trump's side versus Liz Cheney's side on this one? But more importantly, the Republican Party stands for nothing. Right. They they decided that in the last election that they were not going to put a party platform forward. They were going to support Donald Trump. Um, Alexander Hamilton says, if you stand for nothing, you'll fall for for anything. Um, uh, That was all that was both in the play. And he actually said it. And I guess my question is, what a great opportunity for a smart conservative right now or a set of smart conservatives to come out there and say, here's what we stand for from a policy perspective. Take all the major issues out there, climate, uh, global affairs, uh, foreign affairs, uh, wages, health care. Here's what we stand for. And here's what we will fight for. But no, Mitch McConnell came out the other day and said, I am 100 uh, percent working toward stopping the Biden agenda. Hmm including the Biden agenda that gets people checks for their uh, for the fact that they can't work 100 percent about blocking the agenda. Why don't you be about 100 percent about your policies that you think will make Americans do better? So there is there's a remarkable opportunity for conservatives right now. It does seem there is news uh, that has just come out that indicates that some conservatives, people who think of themselves as conservatives, are coming out with a different plan. They're, they're, they're prepared to do something that I think feels like they're maybe launching another party to say, we can't fix you anymore, Republicans, we're moving on. But don't you think that uh, uh, part of the issue is that what they stand for is is authoritarianism and, and, and fascism and white supremacy. And those aren't really poly- like they're there. So many of them are and maybe you're not prepared to say this, but I, I, I certainly I think I am that they're, they're anti-democratic. They're against elections and election outcomes. And the, the concern there is not the past, but the future election that they also deny happened because they didn't win. Yeah, although think about it, there are a whole lot of United States senators, Republicans who win by good margins, who were not going to lose the next election uh, by being who they were. They didn't have to decide that they were anti-democratic, meaning small D Democrat, anti-working. They didn't have to dis- uh, anti-voting. They didn't have to decide that they were uh, about these voting laws and voting fraud. That's the part that surprises me. For a lot of these Republicans, they still would have won their elections for years to come. Why you get on this bandwagon that is going to cause people to really, really work against you and eliminate any ability of being bipartisan, any ability of moderation. That does surprise me because I don't think a lot of the existing United States senators, many of whom are not, they're not uh, extremists in, in any way. I don't think they get up in the morning believing these comp- conspiracy theories or or get up in the morning trying to perpetuate white supremacy or or stop people from voting. I think this has become the bandwagon that has become the, the, the thing that if they don't do, they'll get the wrath of Trump and then they'll have people primarying them and working against them. So I, I, I'd like to think maybe I'm just being generous. I think you're being too generous, but I don't want to believe it is circumstantial. Yeah, I think you're I think you're being too too a little too generous, but uh, but I don't want to belabor it. I mean, I, I, I it's it's hard to get in people's heads and decide why they they they, they do what they I'd do. Love to. I'd love to know yeah. what's really behind this. Like, what do you really mean? Why, why are you really doing this? Do you yeah. really think there was voter fraud? Because 
because I don't see any evidence there. There was a great piece in the Washington Post. It took me like half an hour to read about the genesis of this whole voter fraud thing and how it started with mm. this guy in Texas. I mean, it's it's very easy to make people believe nonsense these days. Uh, yeah, I, I know. But I guess, I guess because uh, this idea that there was voter fraud and that they are going along with. To me, it's so hard. This question about is America a racist country? Let's have a long conversation about that and not make it sound bites. But to me, it's like we've made so much progress. But it's but the the biggest one piece of progress, I might argue, is the civil rights movement in the 60s that culminated in the Voting Rights Act. And right. they're repealing that. And so. They they refuse to 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 after they supported it forever. They're, they've you know, the Supreme Court gutted it and now they're doing everything they can to make it harder. And we're back in that same fight about voting rights. And to me, I don't I feel like I don't need to know much more. As long as you support making it harder for anybody to vote, that's all the answer that we need about who you are and what you believe. Yeah, I, I think you're right. Um I, I wish that everything were more nuanced than is this country racist? <laughs> sure. I feel like that's a trap, right? Yes. When somebody says America is not racist, um, they, they have trapped you into having to say, well, it is. Um, I don't I don't know. I, I don't know that an entity like a country can be racist. I suppose South Africa could because its laws were actually built on racism. But um, but but I think the issue is why are we binary about it? Right. There, there are. There is racism in our society. There is institutional racism. There is systemic racism. And we should all be on the side of wanting to solve that. That's that's the problem that we're having. We, we, we have binaries. Do you have to come out here? So Tim Scott, Senator Tim Scott said after the president's address to the nation that America is not a racist country. Joe Biden and Kamala Harris came out and said America is not a racist country. And that created all sorts of um, uh, stuff, mostly on the left, which is not helpful. Right. Right. No, you need to cut down those barriers to people being their complete selves, whether it's voting or working or living. And that's what we need to solve. If you try and put it into a a bucket about whether we're a racist country or not, then you end up with a different discussion. You end up with a debate about labels as opposed to a debate about policies. Exactly. Well said. And I mean, just the final point I'd argue is there's you know, what is what does it mean to be racist? Calling someone the N word seems most people would agree that's that's a racist thing. But uh, most black folks are less concerned about name calling than they are systemic issues, yeah, police, power, voting, power. education, health care, yeah. et cetera. So let me ask Racism you, with, is, is, which controls power, which has power over decisions that are made, money that is spent. Yeah. That's more important. The idea that people think maybe generally agree it's not good to call people uh, racial epithets. That's not solving racism. Solving racism is power structures that you may not even recognize to be inherently racist or formed on those bases. That's the kind of conversations we should have. I do think the name calling doesn't help. Because of the nature of your work and your career, you've gotten so educated and informed on such a broad range of everything from social issues to science uh, to uh, uh, so many other things, education, health care. You can speak to all of those because you interview those experts all the time. But your bread and butter uh, is where you started was as a, as a you know, a, a business reporter and correspondent. And I, I want to ask you about what I think is kind of the mo- one of the most important issues that's uh, happened, developed over the last week, which is that a few Republican governors uh, and pretty much every Republican commentator, a friend of mine who's a conservative light uh, have, have all said is we are the, the the government aid is too generous and it's preventing people from going back to work. And uh, I heard Asa Hutchinson, the governor of Arkansas, who is ending the federal aid in his state say basically he's pressed on it and he say well it's anecdotal that to me is always the problem we need data and and, and more than someone saying i'm not going back to work because why would i or i am going back all that but what is your take on that argument which is 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 coming up right now all over in conservative circles and not conservative fringe and conspiracy fringe but mainstream mainstream republican conservatives who have always been against government period much less government aid in a in a pandemic So there are a number of states who are doing this. They're dealing, they're talking about the $300 extra weekly unemployment supplement, the part that's given by the federal government, Uh, $300 a week. That would be the equivalent of seven fifty an hour on top of uh, whatever supplement you're already, whatever unemployment you're already getting. So there are a a number of issues here. The first one being philosophical. 
unemployment insurance is insurance into which you have paid. So we twist ourselves into pretzels about not giving regular people money that they paid into insurance for, right? We don't twist ourselves into pretzels. Conservatives don't when they want to give a tax cut to companies that didn't ask for it, right? To cut their tax rates. We, for whatever reason, if you give money to companies, it's trickled down and it's stimulative to the economy and it's fantastic. Giving people, regular hardworking people, their own, the money that they paid into insurance for is a disincentive to work. So just philosophically, we have to get past that. Now, in terms of actual effects, Here's the thing. There are parents who are having difficulty making decisions to go back to work because they don't know what the schooling situation is. You and I have known for a long time that while it's a fringe issue to some people, determining what schooling looks like in September is actually the major issue for most working parents because they have to figure that out. There are uh, jobs are unevenly distributed around the country. There is a problem in terms of hiring in some businesses. The, the, they're they want to reopen. They can't get their workers back. And again, anecdotally, we're hearing from people that uh, employers can't hire people because they're getting this unemployment money. And some people who are getting the money saying, I, I'm not ready to go back. Now, here's the thing. Seven fifty an hour, 300 bucks. So that's that's uh, around what the federal minimum wage is in a world in which you paid people properly. Fifteen bucks an hour. There'd be no dispute. If you're earning $16 an hour today by going back to a job, the unemployment insurance is not going to keep you home. We are a country that pays people low wages. And I understand that that's a big issue. And today may not be the day to fix this because we're in an economy that's repairing and a lot of small businesses have uh, have failed. But if we decided now that over the course of the next four or five years, we would implement a $15 minimum wage or anything higher than the $7.25 that we've got right now, you won't have this problem five years from now because you won't be paying people more money than they could possibly earn in their job. If unemployment insurance does actually give you more money than you would earn in a job, one can see the argument behind this. But what we're doing is causing people to go back to work for a terrible wage while they still haven't figured out what they're going to do with their kids if their kids go to school. So as you said uh, earlier, Pete, all of these discussions deserve longer time. Yeah. They deserve not to be tweets. They deserve not to be bumper stickers. Wages and unemployment and all these things are, are complicated issues. But the problem is our wages in this country are low and unemployment insurance is something that people pay into for their protection for times like this. And you just you 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 touched on my next question was going to be. But there's been a lot of talk about uh, a number of these new policies, some of which have passed, some of which are being proposed uh, that will help families, that will help parents for the first time. I mean, what I've been reading uh, about how so many other countries give uh you know child uh, stipends for p- people with children and basically uh Canada does Canada does Canada gives leave whether you're a father or a mother you can get leave you, you your gu- job is guaranteed you can be off work in some combination for a year and you can divide that up between the father and the mother or, but it's or not two about and two mothers but it's it, but it, but I want to be clear it's not about uh, a a feeling it's not about compassion it's not about economics. morality it's good economic it's 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 smart economics to to, yeah. to help people who have kids survive. And right yeah. now, that's exactly what's happening, especially if your kid can't go back to school for any number of reasons. You can't go to work right. and make minimum so wage. I mean, you kind of already said if you look at something called the work work workplace participation uh, numbers, right? The percentage of people who work, the number of women, the percentage of women available to work who do is substantially lower than the percentage of men available to work who do. It's always been like that. It's gotten worse over the recession because we make women who are caregivers of children make a very difficult decision. Go out, earn a living, spend pretty much all of that money on child care. So you're net zero, uh, but you worked and you had child care. So some people will say, all right, great, but I'm getting job experience and I'm in the workforce and I get out of the house and it's fantastic. Others will say, so I'm spending eight to 10 hours away from my kid every day. And there's no extra money to show for it. Someone else is taking care of my kid every day and I'm just paying. It's just economically wrong. And if you do not encourage all the women who can work to be in the workforce, who want to be in the workforce, to be in the workforce, you're just ending up in a situation where you're going to be like we were before the pandemic, 3.5% unemployment, which is very, very low. And you're short of people. Now, normally a normal country would solve that by saying, let's get more immigrants in. Except we don't do that either. We don't do the two things that you actually have to do. Deal with the women who are not in your workforce properly and then figure out immigration. These are economics. They're not nice feelings. Canada has lots of immigrants and lots of women in the workforce. Not because not 
I'm sure Canadians do like women and immigrants, but it's actually economics. Yeah. One of the silver linings of the pandemic has been recognizing, quote, essential workers. Unfortunately, we haven't recognized those folks enough to the point that we would now learn their value to society and what they are doing to move products, uh, pick food, get it to our homes. We, we've learned yeah. who they are. We've seen these people who have been living in the shadows, white, black, Hispanic, male, female, uh, you know, and but now we need to pay them more now that we see we need to pay them more for what they do. But that is nice to recognize them. But actually, recognition in our society means pay them more. Yeah, we clap that they're around. It's very nice. I but think it, I, I think the best thing you can do for them is just put a sign in your yard thanking the essential workers, not actually paying them more. I think a sign makes you feel good. So you don't really need to actually support a higher you don't wage. You actually need to pay them. But, get, <laughs> but you know what? Paying them more means. Everything means that when I order food, when I go to a restaurant, I mean, it, that's who these people yeah, are. Yeah. You, you do have to think about that. And other countries do do that. And they have higher cost of living as a result. That's a, that's a fact. And people earn more money as a result. So more people can participate in your higher cost of living economy. It works, but it takes time to resettle it. And it does take government policies. And that's what we're thinking about doing right now. The other big story this week that I really wanted to talk with you about is what's happening in the Middle East. Again, you and I have been covering this and talking about this for such a long time. My question to you isn't about what's happening in the Middle East. It's more about covering it in a way that feels like people are going to feel like you've done a good job uh, at being fair. And yeah. it, 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 that is always very hard because if people have knee jerk reactions on who they side with. But if you study the issue the way I see it, I was trying to explain to my wife uh, uh, about it is you, it, as soon as you get in an argument about Palestinians versus Israelis, you're, you're going to lose the argument because you're not agreeing on the starting point with where the conflict began. You can go back a, you know, thousands of years if you want. That to me seems to be part of the problem. How will you cover it on your show? How, how are you looking at the, the 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 violence in the middle yeah. east right now so i think there's the ultimate cause and the proximate cause um we don't have enough time on tv to deal with the ultimate cause the, the, the whole situation about the middle east and whose is it the proximate cause is that for the last 70 years or so um israel has been um declaring places where palestinians live as uh, illegal so they take it back for to make it a firing zone or a nature preserve or, you know, for some reason, which is interesting. And then suddenly you get an Israeli settlement on that land. And that's been happening for years. The U.S. has told them it's not legal. Uh, Israel doesn't doesn't listen because the United States keeps giving them money anyway. Now we have a situation where there is a particular uh, settlement in Jerusalem uh, that is people are being evicted from and there is a court case around it. This one is particularly hot. And that is the proximate trigger to this event. Um, it then has caused other things. Uh, the folks in Gaza, Hamas are sending rockets. The rockets are getting to Ben Gurion airport. They are they are hitting people. The Israelis have now gone into Gaza and they're, you know, and it becomes it gets messed up. It becomes about a million other things. So the issue here is. What rights do Israelis have to live in peace? What rights do Palestinians have to their homes? Uh, what does a fair uh, protest or pushback on that look like? Um, and, and what is the balance of power in, in Israel and Palestine? It is nuanced and it is complicated. I also and cable is not always the best place for nuanced and complicated. It's funny you mentioned that because last night I did something that nobody else probably did. I rewatched Dershowitz, Chomsky, Harvard debate on arab israeli conflict wow. like two hours i watched it in speed and a half velshi okay. like i listened to your show uh just to get it all done quicker and get all that information uh but i i mean when you i think one of the most interesting things is to look at israeli domestic politics and how far right leadership has been for maybe a generation now and it's, and it's more right than it's ever been like yeah. with each passing year it gets more yeah. right yeah and, and, and it is, you know, it's very much like American politics. It, it becomes very nativist, right? It, there used to be a time when most Israelis believed in a two state solution and fairness for the Palestinians. It's moved into a situation where most Israelis have moved to the right. The left has been sort of left out and uh, it's all a security situation. And uh, the other thing is Netanyahu has done a great job of making 
Iran into the major concern for uh, Israelis. So, in fact, lots of Israelis go through life not really all that concerned about the, the fate of Palestinians. It's an effect of apartheid in that country. People live separately. Um, you can go about your life as an Israeli, not really having a full understanding of what's going on uh, with Palestinians. So it's a bad situation. It's a bad situation all around. If you believe, as I do, that everybody there deserves to live in peace. And uh, and, I, you know, it's a mugs game trying to figure out historically uh, what everybody should have. But how do we how do we let them live in peace and fairness? It is a hard place to get to, and it is uniquely hard in times like this where it looks like things are uh, accelerating and getting worse uh, over the course of the next few days. And may, you know, I hope it doesn't. But this this looks like the kind of thing that could uh, become another uprising or or intifada. Yeah, it's really disconcerting. The other thing that people often don't talk about and don't know is how how, how poorly uh, much of the Arab bloc has treated the Palestinians themselves and just use them as a political pawn. They talk about it. Yeah, exactly. They use them as a bumper sticker. Yeah. They, but 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 in fact, um, everybody has let the Palestinians down. Yeah. Everybody has let the Palestinians down. Yeah. They are yeah. there to fend for themselves. Everybody will tell you uh, that they're fighting for the Palestinians. Um, but no, the, the, the Palestinians are, are in really, really rough shape. And by the way, when they've left, they've gone to Lebanon, Jordan. sometimes Syria, sometimes Jordan, where they are also not treated right, very well right, in those right. places. So it's 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 been a tough 75 years to be a Palestinian. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no doubt about it. Uh, so let me ask you now about some of the things that you're doing on the show. You continue to do, I think, the, the best show on television, two hours every Saturday and Sunday, 8 to 10 a.m. And it's, I think, because of obviously you always do a good job yourself and your team does asking good questions, but I continue to think it's because of the guests that you have on. You're always introducing us to new guests. I've stolen many of them. Uh, what are you, why are you going to San Francisco tomorrow or when are you leaving? I forget. Yeah, I'm leaving tomorrow. Um, I'm going to San Francisco to talk to, uh, Asian Americans and people who work in community organizations who are trying to deal with some of the, uh, attacks and racism that we've seen against Asian Americans and to tell some of their history, right? When you walk around Chinatown in San Francisco, you are literally walking around places, including restaurants and and people who've been there for more than 150 years, uh, 170 years. Uh, Asians have been in this country for a long time. We've done some bad things to them. Uh, And, you know, in and amongst dealing with this issue of the immediate response uh, to Asians these days and the violence that they're experiencing, it would help. And we learned this in Black Lives Matter. It would help for us to have some context. When they get here, who are they, by the way, because they're not a monolith, right? Asian American Pacific Islanders are people from different countries, different uh, races, different ethnicities, Um, uh, getting a better understanding in their own words about who they are and what success looks like in this endeavor for them. Uh, And and there are lots of complexities about that, Pete, including uh, an older generation of Asian Americans who were not given to the idea of protest or loudness or, or proclaiming who you are, their message to a lot of their kids was blend in as much as you can right. don't stand out uh, to a new generation of activists uh, of every shape and color no matter what uh, topic you're talking about who believe that you need to shout at the top of your lungs who you are and what your your rights need to be and this is causing a lot of issues and things that need to be uh, talked about within the Asian American community. But I think we also be, have to be involved in that communication, in that conversation with Asian Americans to hear them and see them as they, as they say in the language of empathy. Uh, let's find out what they want of us, what they need of us and how we can make things better for them. I'm looking forward to seeing that. That's it, it, another thing I think you do a really good job of is sometimes you know, we all want to be relevant and cover relevant issues that people are very concerned about, but they fade a little bit in the headlines and we move on and forget them, including yeah. things like gun violence. But you're but, you know, this issue with Asian American hate, uh, it might fade for the mainstream. Certainly those of us who are not Asian American and, and feel as targets, you know, you sit there and you look at this horrible shooting and or, or these seemingly daily attacks on and, and, and just people who are look a certain way walking down the street right. and you go, well, that's horrible. But what you're doing now is is making sure that you go in depth and revisiting that. And I, I value that. That's sometimes hard to do in, in the kind of the mainstream corporate media because there's always this pressure about ratings. But in fact, I think that your show makes things relevant. You make things relevant to the viewer, to the, in my case, listener, because I love the podcast, which I have a complaint sometimes on the podcast. Your music on Velshu, which I love, isn't there. And I really? um, I, it, I think it's fixed, but I was outraged. Oh, yeah, that we got to check out because I like the music, too. I love the music. 
music. It gets yeah. me. It's great music on your show. It, I used to love the Meet the it's Press. It's a little intense for the first thing in the morning, but, you know, I, I like it. Wakes I, me up. Gets me going. Well, to Tell be me fair, me again, happening. listener input, I don't listen live or watch live. Right. I usually watch or well, listen a couple matter. hours yeah, later when I... Yeah. <laughs> so take me into consideration. Yeah. Um, so... I finally, I want to ask you about one more really important issue, which is obviously uh, an issue that you've covered extensively. You've talked to all of the experts, it would seem, which is COVID and, and, and the vaccines. How are we doing? And, and what do you think about like this, this last tranche of people? I'm not talking necessarily about young people, because I think that if you could if you could vaccinate the vast majority of adults, we wouldn't even have to worry as much about young people, which right. is now controversial, too, because for different reasons we can talk about, uh, which were approved this week, and we can talk about that. But but I'm talking about the people that are holdouts, the adults that are holdouts for different reasons, um, a lot of different reasons. But what, what do you think about where we're at, how we've done, and where we're at with adults first? So I think we've done a great job, right? What we did was we solved for the problem that we could solve for, and that was had the federal government back up an effort to get lots of vaccine manufactured and distributed and get it out to people. And, you know, you, you and I saw it from the beginning where it was impossible to get an appointment and there were all sorts of restrictions. Now we're at a place where pretty much anyone who wants a vaccine um, can get a vaccine. We needed to solve for that problem first. We always knew there was going to be a problem of reluctance, but we assumed that once lots of people have had it over several months and you don't see adverse reactions, that that would uh, drop some of the resistance. I am surprised to the degree to which that resistance is not dropping uh, at the rate that I thought it would. It's mostly gone away, but there's still 30 percent of people who probably won't get this vaccine. And so now we have to think about what you do to penetrate that. And there are, as you said, different reasons. There are some people who believe in conspiracy theories and they're anti-vaxxers and uh, they don't like their kids vaccinated for the regular things that kids have to be vaccinated for to go to school. That's a tougher fix. There are people from minorities, uh, minority groups, including black Americans who have historical reasons for wanting to do that. But there are groups who are working in and amongst their midst to try and solve that. I know, for instance, in Philadelphia, we've got one uh, called the Black Doctors COVID-19 Consortium, and they're getting out there with churches and trying to convince people to take it and having family members and influencers in society help them. And they'll, they'll make a lot of inroads on that front. And then there's a a large group of, um, of people uh, who I didn't know existed, but uh, they're, they're not from a, a minority group. They are not necessarily conspiracy theorists, but they're just worried about the speed at which this came out and, and need a little more convincing. And this is just a different job. And I don't even know if it's a federal government job because we need to get really close to those people. Yeah. And we need to figure out a really good influence campaign with a lot of people who are not on social media to say, look, it's going to help us all to do this. Let's, let's get past this. But as you and I have discussed, Pete, who knew that masks were going to be a cultural issue and vaccines were going to be a cultural issue? So we're, we're in different territory now. Is it weird that I still think that you should continue wearing a mask just because of your face? Is, is I, I wear a mask a lot, actually. When I'm out, I still, I still, I mean, I'm fully vaccinated, but yeah. I, I was thinking about this the other day because I went down to the New York Stock Exchange uh, where they were relaxing some restrictions yeah. and I was, I was reporting from outside and I had my mask on and I thought to myself, life's a little bit easier without a mask. It would never occur to me that this is the thing that, yeah. that, that we'd be fighting about. Like, we just don't need to. I, I, I don't, I'm not a mask lover. But it didn't occur to me to hate it. It's just a mask. I just would, a mask. If someone said to me, I, I really feel uncomfortable that you're not wearing a mask, I, I would probably I would consider that. I'd be like, listen, if you feel that uncomfortable, I'll wear a mask for I'm you. And, and in some situation or another, that's that's the whole thing about this. It's, yeah, it's, just, it's just not there's too many hills to die on. This isn't it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I'm very excited to talk to you. I really appreciate your time today. I know you got to go. And I, uh, I, I just want to say thanks. Keep up the great work to you and your team, sir. Thank you. Um, I, I always express to them that you express your appreciation of them because that doesn't always happen. And so they get very excited to say, look, here's a guy who actually listens to our show and he he feels for it. He he, he appreciates the effort that they all put into it. My team is great. I, and they put a lot of work in. Yeah, it. I mean, but there's just there's just so uh, there's so many guests. This this Indian journalist uh, the, writing for the Washington Post, whose name I'm forgetting, that you had on last week, it really struck to the heart. Like I heard all this news about India, and I was upset, it was and amazing. it was upsetting. And then I heard this yeah. this woman, and it was completely different. And but it was uh, she really hit, made such a good point. Um, having this Native American congresswoman on like there's a whole bunch of and all these women of color, you know, throughout covid those guests whose voices you're elevating make a huge difference 
to yeah. a giant block of viewers that don't get to hear from them. And well, I, that's I, the point, right? We get to book these people. We yeah. know who they are. Why don't I give yeah. my viewer access to them? They're they're fantastic. They're interesting because of who they are as people. They're interesting because of their policy views. I, that to me is the richness of this entire job, right? Yeah. Well, keep it up. Keep doing it. Never die. Thank you very much for joining me, sir. Thanks, brother. Ali Velshi at Ali Velshi. Go right now on Twitter and tell him that you really appreciate that he joins me for the conversation pretty much every month. Love talking to that guy and even more love watching and learning from his excellent broadcast Saturdays and Sundays on MSNBC. I think he does a great job. Now, my next guest is a critic of pretty much uh, everybody in media and in politics, and that's one of the reasons I like him. He is a creative writing uh, professor. He is also an author of two excellent books, most recently, American Rule, How a Nation Conquered the World But Failed Its People. I highly recommend you get that book. I recommend you also subscribe to his Substack newsletter, which is excellent. It's called Dispatches from a Collapsing State. And listen to his podcast, The Muckrake Podcast, which he co-hosts with his friend Nick Hauser. It's very, very good. We had a great conversation, as we always do, about the future of the Republican Party, the history of this country, teaching critical race theory and the 1619 Project, and, of course, media. But we started off to having a very personal conversation, and I really like this part here at the very opening. Here now, my conversation with Jared Yates Sexton. He's on Twitter at JY Sexton, where he is prolific. Go follow him there. Subscribe, I said, to all of his things that he is offering and listen to my conversation with him on Stand Up right now. There he is, Jared Yates Sexton. And we talked for a few minutes, so you tell me if this is out of bounds. But you did just share that you are becoming a tattoo guy. We're talking a little bit before I hit record about how the pandemic has changed us. Really surprised by someone at this point in life getting their first tattoo. Yeah, first one. First one. Why? And what is it up? Well, I'll, I'll be honest with you, Pete. I, uh, I, I've i wanted to do it for a while. Okay. Uh, I've thought about doing it. Uh, I was going to do it right before the pandemic. The pandemic hit. And then I was like, the day after my vaccination fully kicked in, fully vaccinated, ready to go. Uh, I was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bite the bullet. I'm going to go do it. And uh, like I was saying to you, I, I see a future of more tattoos, which I'm excited about. Uh, and on top of that, like it, it, it was important to me. And I think tattoos are like this for some people. It was important for me to know major changes. And we were talking about before we started recording. I feel like I have completely changed as a person during the pandemic. And so I wanted to, I guess, mark that or start to mark that. I want to know how you've changed. I think this is a great conversation to have with with anybody. I think we've all must have changed some way, somehow good, bad, uh, hopefully good. But what what is when you say you've always wanted a tattoo, like, did you want this tattoo or like was your impetus to get a to get a tattoo based on you wanted this picture, this whatever it is um, or or something else? Well, it's sort of all of the above. So what I got was the uh, outline of the state of Indiana. Oh, so, okay. So, so home. With a picture of Mike Pence in it. That's really Isn't weird, that weird? Why? And the funniest part about it, and I wanted to be original, Pete, is I got him back in his radio days. Oh, yeah. So it's him <laughs> with, like, the ears on. Right, right. I, did, I didn't notice that he looked the same. Yeah, I just, I just want to go ahead and go on record and clear anything up. Like, it's not VP Mike Pence. Right, right. It's, it's a very specific going Mike. after Mulan. It's, it's denying tobacco causes cancer, Mike Pence. Right, he's 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 signing off on the air and then going to his lobbying gig. That Mike Pence. Is, <laughs> so is why one. Indiana? You grew up in Indiana, and so you're, you're. So I grew up in Indiana, and what what has happened with me? And I don't know how much in the weeds or how personal we want to get on this thing, but I've written about this, I've talked about it, so I'm not afraid to talk about it. Like I I, I come from like this really impoverished plus abusive background, right? I, I went through like all this uh, physical, emotional, mental abuse and all of that. And I have to tell you that that followed me around my entire life. Like, you know, I was always dealing with depression, trauma, all that stuff. Uh, during the pandemic, all of the distractions, right, peeled away. I wasn't going out with people. I wasn't going out and getting drinks. I spent a lot of time in this hammock in my front yard reading, plus also researching for my books and my projects. Uh, my view of the world has completely changed. I feel like for the first time in my life, I'm actually 
living and it's political it's personal it's social it's all of this stuff all wrapped up into one and to be honest i have been meaning to talk about this for a while i didn't know how to navigate it obviously i'm doing it now on stand up with pete dominic but i my my entire life and view and philosophy has completely changed give me more specifics and and do you think it's mainly because you've just it sounds like and i think this is probably true of others as well I don't think it's true of me because the pandemic created a, a, a place I just worked more than I've ever worked in my life because I lost my gig and had to create the new gig like a startup. It was basically the first year of my startup. So all I did was work all the time. So I actually yeah. didn't have a lot of space, I feel like, to explore. But I think that's true of a lot of people who have who had, you know, kind of a steadier uh, lot in life, if you will. Um, but 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 it sounds like what you're saying is that having that time and space to think think to read to learn and to express yourself is is the reason for these changes i'm about to ask you specifically what they are yeah well i'll I'll just go ahead and i'll start by saying this one of the only reasons that you and i have ever talked or met one another or why anybody knows who i am is because i went viral back in 2016 going to Trump rallies. And I was reporting on this stuff and I was like, listen, something's going on with Donald Trump. Something's going on with the American right. It feels fascistic. Uh, my, my family's involved in it. They're being radicalized. And so all of a sudden it went viral and I got a platform since then. And by the way, that was five years ago. So I was at the tender age of 34, you know, and like still like dealing with my own bullshit. And what I had, to, what I've had to do over the past five years I got thrown into the deep end of the pool and I had a conventional understanding of politics and history and I had to learn, you know, I had to like, like, like anybody who's followed me for the past few years undoubtedly has seen that I've, I've been like trying to catch up with the truck, you know what I mean? The whole time. So what I've had to do is completely relearn everything about politics and everything about history. I mean, I'm currently writing the a reconsideration of Western civilization to get to why we are where we are now. And I'm one of those people, and I think you are too. Um, for me, I I need to understand things. I need to know why things happen. I need to know why things occur because I feel powerless if I don't. Like I'm the kind of person that feels better about flying if I know how a plane works. You know what I mean? Like how the airstream sort of goes. And so by learning about history and learning about my place in it, but also learning about things like the human brain, trauma, responses to it, it has made a lot of illogical things suddenly make sense, both in terms of politics, but also the personal. And as a result, I've been able to look at myself and also my place in the political scheme and in the world. And I, it is completely refashioned the way that I view everything. And I feel honest to God, healthier and happier than I've ever been in my entire life. Well, that's amazing to hear. Um, but you, I mean, you basically got Twitter famous, which is no small thing. And, and you went in, you probably always knew I'm going to psychoanalyze you that you were intelligent and curious and, and had a lot to offer as an academic, but no. when you, when, no, you didn't think that? No. And as a matter of fact, one of the things I've had to come to terms with is because of years of abuse, being told that I was worthless, being told that I was a complete fraud. Um, I mean, I think a lot of people are like this. We both know people like this who are talented, but they don't believe that they are sure. right. And so they overcompensate for it or they try and show that they are, And, you know, I had to realize I was like, for the longest time, I thought that I got attention because of a fluke, right? Like it was like lightning struck and Chrissy Teigen retweeted me, you know, and that just happened to be what happened and how anybody got to know. Well, it turns out I'm I'm a smart, talented dude and I was in the right place and I was able to actually sort of see something that other people might not have been able to see or might not have been able to report on. And all of a sudden I had to realize it was like, it doesn't matter how much money I make. It doesn't matter how many books I publish. It doesn't matter whether or not I get promoted or I become a full professor or I get published in this or I do this or I do this. None of those things actually matter. They don't fill up the hole. You know what I mean? Like none of that stuff actually equates to self worth. And I, I sort of had to rethink how the world works through me and how I work through the world. And, you know, basically what damage capitalism does, expectations do, and how self loathing is like completely integral to that system. So it, it was, it was, uh, 
again, I think I described to you, it was like a, a revolution of the mind for me. So what, so, so why, so why, why don't those, why things, don't those things fill up the fill hole, up in, the hole in, in, in your mind? Why those are, those are legitimate achievements. Are you saying that those are kind of been, those are lies that we've been told that these are the ways to measure your success as a human and you've uh, unlearned those and, and, and realized some other measure that is worth more. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. So what I've come to understand, and you know, I did a little bit of research on this for American rule where I was dealing with American history. Um, All of this is psychological manipulation. Um, It it basically was created in in the pursuit of consumer society. And what consumer society, and this was all pushed by a guy named Edward Bernays, who is actually Sigmund Freud's nephew. And he used Freud's ideas uh, to basically create a system of commerce and consumption that told us, yeah, you're kind of awful. But if you buy the right thing, you wear the right clothes, you use the right product, you smoke the right cigarette, all of that, like you will become a better person and they will shield you. And basically, we have been taught to take all of these externalities and to create a persona out of them, to create an armor out of them. And that gets us through the day. And in the meantime, and this is a Western condition, you know what I mean? Like this is a very specific Western uh, tradition, which is. You spend all of that time working on the externalities, on all of, whether or not it's uh, accumulating wealth or power or influence. And meanwhile, on the interior, people are just absolutely at war with themselves. Yeah. And, and, and when you realize that, you start to realize that uh, staying with American politics, American politics is about mental health. American politics is about the pursuit of these externalities uh, to the consequences of the internal and also the social. And so all of that has become increasingly clear over the past couple of years. Well, what is it now then that has changed specifically that has changed that uh, for you and made you feel mentally healthier and better about who you are? What, you, you, you now is the whole filled? And if so, why? Uh, I don't know if the hole is filled. I used to describe it to a therapist of mine that it's like you have like an airplane hanger that like a truck of self-esteem would roll in, but the back door wasn't shut. And so it would just go in and it would go right back out. Uh, There are a couple of trucks in there. What What I've come to realize, and this was important, is that. You know, a lot of the abuse that was heaped on me was being heaped on me by people who had gone through their own abuse and were going through their own problems. But one of the things that happens with people who are victims of abuse is oftentimes that illogical nature of abuse. The mind goes, well, it must be you. Right. Like that doesn't make sense that somebody would do that. So obviously there's something Mm -hmm. rotten about Mm -hmm. you. And so much of my life was spent feeling like I was pulling one over on people. Right. Like, oh, they think I'm smart. They think I'm a halfway decent person. If only they knew how wretched of a person I actually was, the, the, the gig would be over. But what I've come to realize is like, yeah, I've done wrong. Like there have been things that I haven't done well. That has been me at my absolute worst and at my weakest. But I'm a fundamentally decent person and i i i know things like i i'm actually good at understanding how these things sort of work so sort of wrapping my head around that and starting to realize and this is the big giant ball of wax at the heart of it we're we're part of the same family you and i and everyone listening like you know we're all taught that we're alone and we're powerless and that you know we might as well cower in fear and we can't change the world or whatever but the truth is that that is just a means of keeping people from each other and, and keeping reform at bay and changes at bay. And it has made me feel better, not just about myself, but more importantly, about the world and and people in general. And I think that's important. I love this conversation, love this conversation with, anybody, with anybody, but I especially but like I especially it with, with, men, with men, two men having this conversation having and recording it and sharing it. I think it's super important. I greatly appreciate you uh, being so honest and vulnerable. It's, it's uh, very valuable. I think for, for people to hear that and, and hear another person saying like, ah, I can relate to this or, or that. And it's, it's, it's disappointing that we don't do it. I think enough, but uh, bravo. Thank you. Wasn't expecting well, to have that. Intimacy is frightening. I mean, because and and, in particularly we're sitting here listening to a show. I mean, we're sitting here taping a show that literally tens of people are going to listen to. 
tens of people are going to listen to the tens of your fans and <laughs> plus <laughs> <complete>. my family <laughs> don't forget them there's but, more of those know, two it, that's three but I think, it is one family. of those things where and and you know we have to talk in in this moment about someone like a donald trump who has weaponized the public sphere Right. And has has taken politics and turned it into sort of a situation of trench warfare. Like, I don't know who's listening to this. I don't know if I'm giving them ammunition to hurt me. You know what I mean? But but you know what? I think it's important enough to talk about it. And like, here we are, a couple of dudes. And by the way, guys are we've talked about this before. Guys are terrible about this because they're afraid about exposing their soft underbelly that other men will judge them and they'll be seen as less masculine or whatever. And then possibly get ridiculed or shamed out of a circle or whatever. But, um, yeah, I, I, I hope I hope other people have found solace and peace and direction in the pandemic as well. I mean, it's been a horrid tragedy, but hopefully with some of these external they sort of pushed aside hopefully some of us can find some peace and if you want to attack jared he's on twitter at jy sexton <laughs> listen to his podcast the muckrake podcast where you can find more uh of this and then you can use it as a cudgel to destroy him amen just just hammer me into the void uh there's a lot of other broader issues that i want to talk about but you yeah. have been uh writing of course the the podcast continues to be excellent with you and nick uh, and there's links to it so people can uh, listen and, and support. When Jared. are you coming on? If you like the podcast so much, when are you coming I, I on? I mean, whenever, whenever you want. I mean, whenever I don't, I don't. It's a, kind of a weird thing because sometimes I listen to shows and I'm a fan of shows, and and uh, I, I, I very rarely do I say I would I would be a good guest. I I think often I'm like I don't need to. I would rather listen to these people talk than uh, than join myself. But uh, but I would. You know, I'd be happy to come on and I usually also turn a lot of things around like in that case and start asking questions as opposed to being a guest answering questions. I like to do that. I mean, I'll go on someone's panel and, and, and just take the host job because I'm just better at asking questions. So. Yeah. But, I, I, th I think that you have something to offer. We need to get you on pronto. This is past that point. But past the point. Uh, but so I want to talk about um I, I'm loving your newsletter, your Substack newsletter, Dispatches from a Collapsing State, and as always, uh, your Twitter feed. But, you know, you have done such a great job at, at uh, describing today's Republican Party, and I think more importantly, how we got there. I want to, I want to, I wrote something I want to throw out to you, and then I feel like you're going to just kind of toss it out to go further back in history. Not that you're going to say it's necessarily wrong, but. But when you're talking about your own education and how you learn, you've learned so much more, um, especially recently uh, for your research, for your books, et cetera. But my this is what I wrote, because my education began certainly with my brother and, and, and as a young in high school and in college, my brother really kind of radicalized me in a way and introduced me to Chomsky and, you know, other famous respected leftists and anarchy and all kinds of different things, veganism even. But when I started in media is where when I really, I mean, he was the impetus for me being interested in subjects. But when I started in media uh, at Sirius XM, climate science denial was huge. Trickle-down economics had been in place for a while. The Iraq war had just begun. Um, these were all dangerous ideas, Jared, that mainstream conservative Republicans supported. Then deregulating the financial in industry and the insane opposition to a conservative health care reform came next. And finally, I want to end my bookends with birtherism. And mm -hmm. so, like, I know you're going to go back further than that. But to me, all this, I'm, I'm picking up on what you've been dropping in your Substack and on Twitter. This, to me, was insane then with the issues I just listed. Yes. The science and I, the economics, the war in Iraq, um, and, and all the, the Obama, the, the, the attacks against Obama. That stuff was so insane to me that we're seeing yeah. now. I don't have any words to describe because it's just, you know, it's it, it's beyond any sense of, of, of reality. Where do you want to pick up on that to go further back to discuss those things? Because my point is the normal is the, people raving. This is what you've been saying and saying Republicans have lost it. We can't explain this. Of course we could. could ex I, I don't know shit. I was not an academic. I just started reading the newspapers and seeing what was happening in like, you know, the early 2000s going, holy cow, this is crazy. Then. Yeah. And, and you know, I, while I was traveling uh, this past week, I, I stayed in a hotel. And I don't know about you. Hotels are lonely. 
And, you know, you got to put something on. And I wasn't going to put on like Good Morning America or the Today Show. That just, oh, it makes my skin crawl. So, of course, because, you know, I still have some self-harm in me, I put on Morning Joe. And, you know, <laughs> watching watching Morning Joe as he's selling Starbucks coffee. And, and Pete, he's just like, what happened to the Republican Party? Right. What happened to conservatism? Yeah. What happened to the party of Reagan? And it's like... You can't get high on your own supply. That is one of the fundamental rules. And for all of these people, and you know, they're just like, oh, Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill, they used to sit down and hoist a few drinks and they'd figure it out. And if only we went back to that. Meanwhile, Ronald Reagan is working to destroy the social safety net, privatize all of the functions of the United States government while talking about the Soviet Union as a satanic threat, talking about demons running through the streets. Meanwhile, the evangelical right is making everyone who is poor a sinner and worthless and devoid of human dignity. And, and all of that was a lie. Trickle down economics never worked. They knew that it didn't work. Nobody who ever talked about trickle-down economics ever once thought that it was a way to make a system work because everyone knows that since there was a stock market, if it is not regulated, it will overheat itself, it will grow and grow and grow until it collapses. The and very by the way, best this evidence, just happened. The, sorry to interrupt, the very best evidence, though, of, of what you're saying is that George H.W. Bush ran against voodoo Ronald economics. Reagan in the primary and called it voodoo economics, called Reaganomics voodoo economics, said it was basically crazy, it was wrong, it doesn't work. But then, of course, he lost the primary and Reagan picked him to be his VP and he denied basically ever saying that. And to me, that was the most convincing yeah. argument. It wasn't an economic argument. It was a political argument. And I was like, oh, oh, he even he knew, but then, then just, Decided not to care anymore about it, to, to, to fall into the uh, orthodox. I didn't. Uh, and let's, didn't and let's be you. very clear about what trickle down economics is. Uh, trickle down economics. And, and, and we need to go on the record for this because the right is so good at rhetorical arguments. That's where they're the best. They, they, they are just fantastic at framing these arguments. Trickle down economics is a misnomer. What trickle down economics is, is a redistribution of wealth. They always say that it's like taking money from the top and giving it to the bottom. No, what actually happened with some people would call it neoliberalism, but that's always confusing. I go ahead and go with hypercapitalism. The philosophy of hypercapitalism is redistribution from the bottom up. It says that those people have no idea what to do with money and that the people who have money obviously deserve money. So they should have the money and make the decisions. It was the handing over of politics and society to the market is what it was. And, and you know, on top of that, like the Cold War, the revival of the Cold War in the 1980s, it wasn't about an actual war. It was about funding and refunding the military industrial complex of the 1950s and 1960s. So and in and, and that way, they took money from the bottom from human projects like healthcare, infrastructure, education, and then gave it to all of these people so it could be at the top. It never worked. And what it was, was it was a reaction to FDR's New Deal, which was a course correction from a deregulated, unre unregulated market. And what ends up happening, let's take it back even further. Let's go back to the first Red Scare. And this is post-1917. You actually have, after the Russian Revolution, that's when you start having all of these lynchings. That's when you start having all of these racial incidents. The second Red Scare, which people would call McCarthyism. Everybody says, well, the Republicans were really afraid that there were communists in the government. No, they used the initial Red Scare scare tactics and they went after new dealers. They went after the remnants of FDR's administration and the people who had been in government to regulate government. And they went after them and said that they were communist or Oh my God, Pete, they, some of them were gay. I, I know, I know, I know they, they can't be in government. They can't be trusted. This, the second Red Scare or McCarthyism was about ridding the government of the idea that the government should serve the people or invest in human projects. After they got rid of them in the 1950s, we move forward into desegregation where the Republican Party realized that there was an opening for blatant white supremacist paranoia in order to build the coalition yeah. that would eventually become Trumpism. 
And the coalition that becomes Trumpism is the main animating uh, philosophy of the Republican Party outside of redistribution of the wealth from the bottom to the top. And those two things have gone together. None of this is inexplicable. Matter of fact, it's not even that hard to understand when you look at the actual history of it and to sit around. And by the way, Joe Scarborough was part of the contract with America crew, which told everybody that Bill Clinton was trying to sell out the country and he was an evil liberal who wanted to, you know, invite in the UN and it would end up in Auschwitz. Like they played roles. Most of the people who are on the news, most of the people who are these paid pundits, they've all been part of it. They all know the actual truth of it, but they're so lost behind sepia-toned American history, this mythology that makes no damn sense. They are all covering for it, and it's so easy to connect the dots, and they're unwilling to. Is it sepia or sepia? Is it sepia? I've always said sepia. Is well, it, it sepia? confused me when you said it. I was like, what's that word? And I go, oh, I think you meant sepia, but maybe I'm wrong. Is sepia right? I don't know. People listening are going to I prefer to tweet sepia. You know, us. it's the same way when people say bona fides. I want oh. bona fides. Yeah, I want bona fides too, but I have I want bona fides. But I've done bona fides. I've said it right here on this podcast. I said it the other day. I changed and I changed and myself I don't for a couple of hours. <laughs> I was so mad at myself, Pete. I was in my mind. You know how you plan the sentence you're getting ready to say? I, I put, I put I bona fides in there. I was like, Jared, you better damn well not say bona fides. And then I said it and I was just like, oh. Well, I already God. said this to somebody. So people are going to hear me say it again. But I literally pronounced the, the following out loud and then knew it was wrong. Went back and edited it out and pronounced it correctly. I, I actually did this two nights ago. I said I was reading a quote. Uh, on the podcast here recording late at night. And I read, I said, uh, posthumous. <laughs> said it. And I went back and I, and I looked it up. Like, why does, I know that's not how that word is pronounced. And it was so embarrassing for someone who's been doing this as long as I am reading and saying things. That's what I mean. And so I went back and I corrected it. But then I thought for a long time, if I had said posthumous, and 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 you were a paying subscriber. I wouldn't blame you. For you would have messed me up for a couple of days. Yeah, man. I, I would have blamed you for rethinking that subscription. <laughs> well, no, I think what ends up happening is that the subscriber hears it. and They're like, God, Pete's a smart dude. Have I? And then all of a sudden you're you're in the middle of the night. It's three thirty a.m. in the twilight hours. And you're just like remembering every time that you've been in a meeting with people that you think <laughs> respect you. And you said posthumous. And all of a sudden it's just like posthumous. Post humus. <clears throat> so where are where is I love that you titled your Substack article a train coming into station because it's kind of a metaphor for where the conservative movement ha- has arrived at. And that is in reference. This piece is in reference to uh, forcing Liz Cheney from her leadership position today as we're taping this. So where is the train on on the journey of concert? Like, what's next? And I saw somebody uh, tweet. Remember when we thought Louis Gohmert and Steve King were crazy? So where are we now? Well, I want to start by saying that I think it's so appropriate that it's Liz Cheney being purged from leadership. Like it's so appropriate that it's a Cheney because one of the things that has happened here and the Republican party is so full of embarrassments, Pete, that the George W. Bush administration is just an orphan who supported these people, you know, who was for this war. Everyone knew that this war was wrong and illegal. What don't, don't look up my, you know, don't look up my past articles, please. Don't uh, don't look me up on MSNBC as a sparkling flag graphic plays, you know. <laughs> and so, what ends up happening, of course, is that the Republican Party is completely incoherent because it has no actual principles, right? It's never actually been fiscally conservative. Even Reagan was running up deficits like a madman. They're not actually socially conservative. I mean, look at the interference they ran for Donald Trump. You know what I mean? Like, and, and on top of that, like, who knows what any of them are doing in airport bathrooms at any given time? You know what I mean? Like, this entire party has been incoherent. The only remaining through line is the pursuit of power and profit. That's the only thing that actually matters to these people. Where we've arrived now with the purging of Cheney is that you have a party that knows that the election of 2020 was not stolen. 
They know that it wasn't. If, if I, I don't even know how you can drive a car to the Capitol if you don't understand that. You know, they know that it's a political ploy. It's a useful paranoid conspiracy theory. They've went ahead and they've sanitized QAnon. Q doesn't even make post anymore because it's become Republican orthodoxy. They don't need to. You know, like at this point, it's just baked into the bread where we are now. And I think Marjorie Taylor Greene and everybody laughed at me when I was like, she's going to be an incredibly influential member of that party. Mm. What she has done over the past few weeks is she has taken the normal paranoid uh, uh, white supremacist conspiracy theory rhetoric. She started to inject it with um, key words and phrases, armies, generals, traitors, uh, 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 terrorists. What we are seeing is the cold cultural war turn hot. And what yeah, you quoted, quoted her from, tweet, you, you tweeted a, a tweet uh, of hers uh, that where she wrote members who support terrorism don't belong in Congress. Hashtag Jihad squad. She's talking about uh, uh, Rashida Tlaib and Elon Omar for sure. Yeah. And by the way, what do you do with terrorists? You kill, I mean, you, speaking you kill of them. Cheney's, yeah. you kill them. You, you also revolt. You also I would revolt if I thought my vote was stolen. I would also, you know, those people that, uh, you know, insurrectionists, they believed Donald Trump. They yes. believed the president that that they that the election was stolen from him. And that's why they revolted. It's that's not unnatural. <laughs> And American history shows us this is not the first time any of this has happened. Going back into the Red Scares, this is why people were lynched. This and, and, and by the way, we don't like to talk about this, but during the Civil Rights Movement in the South, you had figures like George Wallace and uh, anti-desegregationist or white supremacist making speeches about how civil liberty marchers and protesters were puppets of, of Russia. The entire point is that when the power structure is challenged in America, the right always blames conspiracy theories and they start the process of not just othering the opposition, but delegitimizing the opposition. So at this point, it says, well, they're they're all criminals. Uh, they're child abusers. They're Satanists. They're terrorists. And as a result, because they can't win elections, because they're not able to legitimately wield political power, what they end up doing is they use apocalypticism and white supremacist paranoid conspiracy theories to legitimize preemptive violence. This is one of the reasons why all of these laws are being passed that are disenfranchising people, making it harder to vote because it's illegal. They're not real Americans. They're committing crimes. And now we have this new instance, which is if you fight against us, you're not a real American. You're a terrorist. You're you're a threat to America. And as a result, you should be treated as such. So where the station is, is unfortunately is smack dab into uh, anti-majoritarian, anti-democratic, uh, fascistic type activities, and and we've seen this thing coming. It, you know, it's like one of those things where, like, out in a plane state, you can see the the train coming for miles and miles yeah. and yeah. miles. Yeah. The only thing that has kept it going is that people are in uh, dangerous denial of what's actually happening and they don't want to believe what's actually occurring. Yeah, you uh, you also tweeted, people who shake their heads and wonder how the GOP got to this point are in denial, either willful or unwitting, and are trying to spin a fairy tale that has absolutely nothing to do with reality or history. It's only confusing <laughs> if you're in denial. You also say, this has been the Republican Party forever. Never, never forget that. It's not, you know, Liz Cheney and other Trump critics you write should, should uh, be lauded uh, but let's not forget that they've been riding this train for a long time. Jumping off right before the rise in the station isn't heroism. I love that one. This is them. This is who they've always been. They just got out. She's just jumping off at the very end. And uh, probably because her dad told her to. That was that was unfair. That was unfair. I don't know. I, I, I mean, it, it's to. true, though. And, and I have to say, you know, watching people like George W. Bush and Dick Cheney be laundered and revitalized over the past couple of years because of Donald Trump and these movements has been so repulsive because you don't get you don't yeah, get people LARPing as fascist. You don't get people endorsing this stuff, talking about terrorism without Bush and Cheney. 
You just don't. It's impossible. It is an important link in there. And another part of it, and this is important, too, is that those funds that were used for those operations and those military operations and these hegemonic uh, uh, crusades that were created are part of the reason why we are in this period of radicalization and alienation. All those things have been going on all along. And and, and I have to say, and this is important because I, I know that somebody out there is screaming right now at their radio. They're like, what about what about Chuck Todd? People who have these people on their on their shows, mm. right? When you watch those shows, they are simulations of DC cocktail parties. It's when all of these people, it doesn't matter on which side of the aisle, they end up together, they're drinking cocktails, they're talking about the sport of this stuff. Those people have been in complete denial because they don't want to believe that they've been a part of it. They don't want to believe that they've profited off of it, and they don't want to believe that they've been partying with a fascistic movement. And as a result, when you turn on your TV, it's not going to be given to you. And also because of the fact that the TV, and I know people are going to be shocked when they hear this, it's owned by corporations. It's owned by people who work with these people who have the same yeah. sort of goals in mind. And so the political reality is actually really frightening and really different from the story that we've all been fed. And when you realize that, you can start to work against it. You know, I think I probably told you this before, but maybe I haven't. Uh, one of my my, my favorite moments uh, in the last couple of years was when MSNBC's Katie Turr came on my SiriusXM show to promote her book, which she'd written about, I think, covering the Trump campaign. She was on the, you know, the, the whole time. Uh, and I said to her, kind of... Uh, I was surprised that that this was in at all was at all controversial, but I, I suppose I had an inkling that she might want to beg off. But I basically said something to the extent of Trump is a white supremacist, and she said she pushed back. She says I don't, you know, I won't say that. I'm not gonna, you know, I gotta find the audio of that. But I just remember being surprised. It's like, wait, you covered the guy. You cut. Co- you covered. You were on the campaign. You've seen all of it. You have all of the context. What do you need to know past birtherism anyway? And she couldn't do it. And it illustrates your point uh, specifically about a liberal, you know, MSNBC in that case. And I'll just won't forget that moment. Like it was so obvious then. And now everybody says it right, including her. But then they weren't they weren't she wasn't willing to go that far, which was because she didn't want to get the, 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 you know, criticism of that. Right. Well, yeah, and, and it's really hard to talk about white supremacy. I, I'm, I'm sorry, but if you're hanging out at the Nissan dealership watching MSNBC at 2.30 in the afternoon, like, you know, waiting on your oil change, like, you don't really want to be confronted with the history of colonization, slavery, and genocide, you know? it's and Instead, you want to hear, like, five-minute clips that always end with, very interesting, but we'll have to leave it there. <laughs> you know, it's like, well, great, okay. But, like, the, that's one of the reasons why why this stuff doesn't actually get dissected is because it's uncomfortable, but you also have to take a look at how you have benefited from it. And when you don't, movements like this grow up who use completely altered reality history, right? There's a reason why we're having arguments about history right now. Why you have Rick Santorum who says there was nothing there, right? How you have a Mark Levin who, what a, what a prince that guy is, by the way coming out and saying that capitalism has absolutely no relationship with racism, even though racism is the basis of capitalism and capitalism takes off during slavery and the exploitation of people of colors and, uh, and colonization. So what you actually end up having is a culture which is completely ignorant about itself, both by design, but also self delusion. And so you can get to the bottom of things. I mean, they, they, none of this stuff is actually useful for starting to dissect how we've arrived here or what's going on. And so you have a lot of people who think that they know what's happening and they're totally mystified, Pete. They have no idea how any of this shit occurred. And meanwhile, it's just it's right there. It's not hard. Uh, one of the issues is being covered really poorly. And this is probably we'll, we'll have to end here. But I want to ask you about uh, for sure is is this idea of uh, critical race theory uh, being yep. taught in schools, the 1619 project being taught in schools and and what many of us would describe. I'm sure you'll give it a much more articulate uh, phrasing, but as accurate history of America being taught in schools. 
has been rejected by the whites all over America. They're terrified, the whites. And obviously in the, the media, the whites just screaming and certainly in the Republican Congress. What do you make of of the controversy over all of that being taught in schools and the concerns that the whites have? Well, a couple of things, uh, and I want to get to it because I think the explanation for that is really, really telling. You've you've heard the term cultural Marxism, correct? Um, I don't think so. I don't think so. And this is one of those. This is one of those things that shows up on Fox News at about seven fifteen on a random Thursday, and I guess it's just like this is cultural Marxism, or the idea that there there is stuff that is out there that is undermining American patriotism. It's undermining traditional values. It's in our movies. It's in our award shows, our video games, our music, all that stuff. It's like stuff that that uh, is is poisonous to you know conservative ideals. Well. I've always heard this and I've always just thought, oh, that's weird. They think it's a bunch of Marxists who are doing this. I found out the actual root of this. And it's funny, which is Nazi Germany and cultural Marxism is this idea that, of course, that Jewish people are trying to destroy nations and that they're trying to control people. And they're doing so by manipulating people through the media. That is the idea of cultural Marxism. The idea that the right is pushing right now with critical race theory, 1619 project, even like things like my book, American Rule, I get attacked for this pretty regularly. Oh, yeah, with sure. It. Yeah, I didn't even th- imagine. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. So what ends up happening is they say no actual history. And I'm talking about objective history. I'm talking about facts. I'm talking about things that have led to things and actual events, things that don't involve, you know, George Washington getting on an eagle and flying over Mount Rushmore. Right? <laughs> Wait, did you he know, do that? Uh, oh, absolutely. He did. And, and just had a cherry tree under his arm. Was while he, he, did t- it. <laughs> was he tiny incredible. or was it a giant eagle? I, that doesn't, I thought he was a big man. Pete, this is America. It was a giant eagle. It was a giant eagle. But, you know, the things that we don't want to pay attention to are things like as the Haitian Revolution was going on, George Washington was sending amazing amounts of money to support white slavers and planters. You know what I mean? Like that, that, that stuff doesn't feel good. Or the fact that the signing of the Constitution was all about uh, implanting a wealthy slaveholding white class to rule everything at the expense of everyone else. Those things are rough to understand. They're complex. Complicated, but here's the the larger issue, which is white supremacy and hypercapitalism are really brittle. Like they really, truly are. Like they're very good at protecting themselves. They're very good at bringing in challenges and profiting from them. Right, turning them into. I mean, Martin Luther King could not be reached for comment on this, you know, and as he's selling Apple computers posthumously. And so, ah. what we actually have here is. These narratives, these mythologies, they're they're child stories. They're fairy tales that we're taught. This history, this quote unquote patriotic history, which is the idea that America is a perfect country or the champion of liberty and equality. It whitewashes all of the blemishes out of this. And it leaves people with, with a misunderstanding of who they are and who they've been and who they're becoming. So right now, as there is this moment of change, both demographically, but also with reality, they have to protect the story. The story is the last sort of firewall against cultural change, because when people start realizing that they've been taught lies their entire lives, suddenly they're like, oh, I don't have to be miserable. Oh, wait, I don't I I, I deserve human dignity. And on top of that, white supremacy and patriarchal supremacy actually hurt me, too. That's crazy. Yeah. Maybe we should yeah. do something about that. The mythology has to be protected at all costs, which is where we are. Yeah, it is. And it's it's interesting. It's fascinating to me because as a young man, I remember learning a different history, you know, again, back to my brother and then Howard Zinn. And I do remember being kind of like resistant to it and not wanting to believe it because it, it was there was there was a certain shame involved. But th- I look back now and say, well, that was immature because now I look at it and go, I don't I don't care. It doesn't affect me that horrible things happened. I just want to know an accurate sense of history. I, it, it, that's, that's all I want to know. And then for the reasons that you just described about that, you can unlearn and not have those feelings, not feel lesser than, or not think that this is the land of opportunity. Anybody can succeed. No, no, that's not real. Let, let's be honest about what this is and, and how it's set up and, and, and why it's set up that way. But I don't, uh, my point is there's no shame there. It's, it's I think often, mm-hmm. You know, it's not as political, but it's religious about 
what George Carlin did for me. And 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 yeah. I remember I was on the radio on the comedy channels of series when he died. And so, so many listeners called in and said what George Carlin did for them. And now I've become good friends with Kelly Carlin. And so, you know, it's a really interesting perspective in reading her book. But my point is, what George Carlin taught me something different than I had been taught about religion. That made me feel so much better. It made me feel better hearing him say these things. It made me feel liberated. That's what it makes you feel. It doesn't. Maybe there's some concern and, and confusion for a minute, but in the end, you feel more liberated. You feel better about yourself and about your future and about your kids and everything in a way. Is that, am I making any sense? Absolutely. And Carlin was a thing for me too. Like I was a huge Carlin guy. And I have to tell you that I can chart my life based on watching Carlin specials because when I was younger, there are moments in each Carlin special of these bits. There are moments where like he's preaching your truth yeah. and you're just like, Carlin's the best dude in the world. And then at certain moments in your life, you'll come to a criticism of a sacred cow for you. And all of a sudden you're like, what is he getting after right now? Like, what is this? Well, this feels a little uncomfortable. And eventually over time you start to realize you're like, Holy shit, George Carlin kind of had some stuff figured out. Yeah. Like he really did. Yeah. And, you know, I, I used to have, um, and one of the things that's happened to me in the last few years, I used to very much be in that mindset of, oh, the Republicans are evil. And so the Democrats are naturally a mirrored good. Right. Like they're they're perfect. They don't have any problems. They've never been on the wrong side of history. And then, of course, you start maturing. Right. And then all of a sudden, the Carlin bits that are about it's all a game, both sides, blah, blah, blah. All of a sudden, those things start hitting differently and you start coming out of, you know, Plato's cave. You start realizing that most of this stuff, most of the stories that you've been told have been mythologies to hide the accumulation of resources and wealth. Yeah. A lot of it. And there's certainly things that I disagreed with that Cor- Carlin said, but he's a comedian and, and a philosopher. And that's OK. And we shouldn't hold anybody, uh, put them anybody on a pedestal that they are always right. And uh, that's something I've had to learn as well. So. And by the way, Liz Cheney is a great example of that. As people struggle, they really, truly want to make her into a resistance hero. And I've coined a term. I've coined a term, Pete. I'm, I've, I've brought this up. I want. I don't want to. Don't want to end it without bringing. It. I'm calling it Comeyism. Oh, because I think I think James Comey is the perfect example of this. A person who, depending upon the day, depending upon the press release, depending on the announcement, is either the scourge of the world, absolutely hated. He's in Trump's pocket, or he's a white knight. He's a savior. He's a messiah. He's against Donald Trump. And it depends on the day when he moves. It's a lot like professional wrestling. And that's what we try and do. We want heroes and villains in our politics when, in fact, it's so many different gradients of gray. And Liz Cheney is particularly one of those people. That's a great one. I, that's a great example of it. Comey is a perfect example of it. Uh, he's right when you agree with him and wrong when you don't. And uh, people have are very confused by a lot of that. You just cleared up, up so much. What a great talk, as always. Thank you so much, Jared, for joining me. I really appreciate it. You're the best, Pete. Thanks. Stand up. No, thank you. Thank you, all of you, for listening. Boom, two hours almost exactly. Well, uh, one hour and 56 minutes is where I'm at right now as I speak. I thank you for any or all of it that you listen to. I thank you for your support on this podcast, which is free, but certainly not cheap. It's a full-time gig for me and keeps me very busy every day booking it and prepping for it and hosting it, editing it, posting it, promoting it. I can't do it without your support. A whole bunch of new subscribers all deserve shout outs and welcomes, which I promise you I will get to. Tonight, I will be hosting our weekly hangout, our special guest candidate for mayor of Buffalo, an amazing life story. India Walton will join us. She was on the show yesterday. Can't wait to talk to her. Can't wait to see you. So I hopefully you will show up tonight. That's it. Out of time. I love you. Check us out on the Discord platform anytime where you're never alone. If you're a stand-up subscriber, go to the paid subscription link on the show notes. Right now to subscribe, write a review on Apple Podcasts. Give me five stars, and I'll give you all the love I can. Thank you very much, folks. I'll talk to you tonight or tomorrow right here on Stand Up. Trees, you got to stand up. Hey, you've been sitting so long, you got the creep.
He needs you gotta stand up. Stand up. I think you dry the wheels in leaking grease. Boy, you better stand up. Stand up. Well, there's a whole lot more of us who know us right. They'll keep right on ignoring us if we keep in sight. You got to open up the window to let in some light. You gotta stand up. Stand our ground and then stand up, stand up. Well, the founding fathers saw a land for all. They had to stand up, they had to stand up. They had a keen imagination for a crystal ball, drawing all the plans of stand up. But all they had to go on was the time they were in with other causes for laws. And since they weren't even sent, they knew that change was gonna come before the change could begin. Experiment if you stand up. All right, we got to speak up, we got to reach up and raise your voice in every way you know how. Don't be toes up, you got to show up. Ain't no better time to do it but now. No need to pledge allegiance to no one's and try to rise up. Show obedience to the voice inside and listen well and it'll tell you not to run it. Stand up in the darkest night. 